Good afternoon and greetings from uh, Rice University. My name is Igor Marjanovic, and on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff of Rice Architecture, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our third public lecture this semester. Today, we are joined by two esteemed architects working together, Cecilia Puga and Paola Velasco, who will present their current work while reflecting on the larger theme of our annual lecture series, Building Identities. Aiming to bridge the gap between the social and the formal, our lecture series presents the construction of human identities and physical structures as mutually intertwined. I am deeply grateful to the entire lectures committee for their work on our public events, including faculty members Juan Jose Castellon and Liz Galvez, as well as staff members Maria Nicanor, Shona Forney, Noel Hines, and Christine Verley. Christine is by now a household name to many of you due to, due to her Zoom invites and reminders about our public events online. Uh, thank you, Christine, and thank you all for joining. I'm delighted to introduce our panel today, who will help me welcome Cecilia and Paola to our community. I'm joined by two amazing Rice Architecture students, Danny Ennis and Sebastian Lopez, who will help moderate the Q&A as part of our program. Please note that while the chat function has been disabled, you're welcome to post your questions in the Q&A box throughout our event today. I'm also joined by Assistant Professor Juan Jose Castellon, a dedicated teacher, scholar, and architect, doing some very innovative work on the cusp of building design, technology, and culture here at Rice Architecture. Most recently, his work was featured in the Seoul Architecture Biennial, and I'm delighted that he's here now to introduce Cecilia and Paula to all of you. Thank you, Juan Jose. Thank you very much, Igor. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our guests, Cecilia Puga and Paula Velasco, and to welcome them to Rice Architecture in this digital format. One of the main motivations of our lecture series is to reflect the multicultural nature of Houston and to enrich our academic environment with different voices and different cultural backgrounds. In this regard, Cecilia and Paula truly represent the best values of Chilean architecture, a collaborative model of practice that combines design talent and technical command, bridging different generations and materializing projects with precision, sensibility, and solid ethical values. Cecilia Puga has developed her professional practice independently in Santiago de Chile since 1995, with an outstanding and substantial body of work, including projects such as the house in Bahia Azul or the vaulted house in Los Vilos. She has developed her academic activity at Universidad Católica de Santiago, the ETH Zurich, Austin University of Texas, GSD Harvard, and the Barcelona Institute of Architecture. On the other hand, Paula Velasco received her Master of Science in Emerging Technologies and Design at the Architectural Association, and she is undergraduate and master's professor at Universidad Católica de Chile. She was one of the five finalists of the 2013 Young Architects Program, and she was nominated for the Rolex Program in 2014. Together, they founded Cecilia Puga, Paula Velasco Arquitectura, a practice that connects independent professionals from various disciplines and specialties. They have participated in several national and international competitions, and their recent projects include the new headquarters of Chile's Ministry of Cultures and Heritage, the infrastructure design project for Keulat National Park, and the master plan of, for Punta Arenas International Passengers Terminal. More recently, they obtained the first place for the design of the Chilean Pavilion for the Expo Dubai 2020 in collaboration with Smilan Radic. Cecilia and Paula have an exceptional capacity to conceive their projects integrating material, structural, and construction systems, but also the ability to relate these technical questions to historical, architectural, and cultural references. Their work is exemplary regarding the agency that we have as architects to build spaces, experiences, and shared identities. Welcome, Paula and Cecilia. The virtual floor is yours.
And hi, uh, Juan Jose. Thank you very much uh, to invite us. And thank you, Igor, uh, and all the RISE community. Thank you for having us today with you. We are very glad to present today just two projects in a more deep um, um, presentation. Um, and uh, I will just start uh, next October uh, 19 will mark two years since a social revolt took place in Chile highlighting several and serious social, urban, cultural, and gender inequalities issue, as well as native people's historical exclusion. The conflict was diffused with a transversal political negotiation that resulted in a gender paired constitutional convention born out of popular vote with seat reserved for ancestral representative. This conventional is currently working on the draft of a new constitution for Chile, which shall allow and organize in a synthetic way, a better coexistence, a new relationship among citizens and their territory and in a more effective system of government social care. Among other things, we can say that three monuments summarize this process. The first one is the monument to General Manuel Baquedano, a 19th century Chilean military and political hero, uh, done by the sculptor Virgilio Aria. It used to be placed at the heart of Santiago protests, around which the constant conflict between the demonstrator and the police is represented. The second and third are the former National Congress and the Palacio Pereira buildings, both designed and built in the second half of the 19th century and declared national monument. The Constitutional Convention operate in both of them. It is there that Chile's culture is now being debated. In our country's context, these three monuments will undoubtedly synthesize the construction of a new political and institutional identity. The first, questioning the role and meaning of the urban monument as an eminently patriarchal and colonial symbol of a society undergoing transformation. And the two buildings as the special urban representation of a Republican will to build basic consensus for future coexistence. Creation and preservation of human culture memory is articulated from the drowning of time through the construction of diverse monuments that act as means of remembrance. In his manifesto of uh, 1903, the modern cult of monument, Alof Regal developed a visionary approach that contextualized the very concept of monument and historical value to the time and cultural reality of the observer, so differentiating two types of monument. Uh, on one side, the intentional, which is born as a monument and materialize a historical and cultural moment. This work, whatever its nature, as an intentional commemorative value and seek to avoid in a certain way, said Regal, that the moment is celebrated, it is always present and alive in the conscience of prosperity, and therefore will constitute a clear transition to the value of contemporary. On the other hand, the unintentional are the historical monuments, which are not born as such. Unintentional monuments are those that acquire their value through collective imagination and history that assign meaning and transcendence to an event considered irreplaceable. In this sense, the definition of monument cannot have an objective sense, but only a subjective and cultural one. It is we, modern subject, who attribute it to them and thus participate in dynamic process of patrimonialization. Unlike monument, Regal continues, the value of this artifact can be of two types, 
that of antiquity around their non-contemporary or modern aspect, their opposition to the present, which manifests itself in an imperfection, in a lack of continuity, in a tendency to erosion of form and color, and that of historical value, how they represent a certain stage of the evolution of one of the creative field of humanity. We are not such, so much interested in the traces of the passage of time, but in its genesis and another time as a human work. Next, we are going to show you two monuments on which we have been in work, one intentional, the other unintentional. As a result of the social movement that Cecilia has just described, feminist and gender equality issues have been growing in visibility and presence in Chile's social and public agenda. The parity among members of the Constitutional Convention is a testimony to this. The Ministry of Cultures of Women Affairs, in conjunction with private business and cultural entities, Call for a contest for the design and construction of a public sculpture to partially update the lack of female representation in a urban public monument. The call addressed to visual artists and women's teams so to design and build a monument to the Chilean woman. Renowned Chilean visual artist Josefina Gilisasti, together with Barbara Barreda, invited us to participate and create a sculpture that would be a space of encounter and would be built using basketry and weaving techniques, linked to ancestral cultures that women have preserved from generation to generation. Our proposal questioned the concept of monument and its imposition in public spaces associated with heroes or direct symbolism. We went for a solution in which the body can interact with this cultural piece, so proposing an experimental work singular to each person. Dionai is a work constructed to the extent that it is inhabit and interact with. What mattered to us was to form connections originated from the community. And that is why we insisted on an open space that acquired meaning from cooperation and collaboration. The piece arises from the image of a carnivorous plant called Venus flytrap, both beautiful and murderous, a flower that crosses borders and defies the categories by which we seek to apprend nature according to the kingdoms, animalia, plantae, fungi. It be belongs to the plant world, but when soil nutrients are scarce, it incorporates insects into its diet. For this purpose, it contains an attractive and invited interior space that is designed to provide them with the energy that the soil sometimes lacks. It contractions consists of a three-dimensional porous fabric containing an a habitable interior space. It is made of 16 uh, millimeter thick smooth steel bar that aim structurally to generate a complex, resistant, and stable hole. It dimension uh, 13.5 meters long and 18.5 meters wide, uh, and uh, it has a height of 19.5 uh, meters. It has two main layers. The first, two meters from a curved and continuous plane, assembled from 30 millimeters tubular steel pieces, giving the public a safe and a smooth surface to the touch. A bowl. Above those uh, two meters and up to its maximum height, the fabric became more complex. We introduced a series of horizontal elements that we call forks and that intervene the interior space. We sought to build material density, not using materials that has density. In a way, the sculpture represents its own ring. 
It is the minimum monument of the peace. There is nothing that can be disintegrated. If something is taken away, it collapses, it disappears. It is not the material, but the fabric that produces the structural resistance. Today, we are starting the construction phases of the sculpture to later be assembled in bigger pieces to be then transported and reassembled in the site. These are some of the three, the image that we present to the contest where we can see like the first level, the, two, uh, the first level that has the 30 meter thick uh, steel. And that in that image, we can see how we whip with this ornamental forks element up to uh, 9.5 centimeters. This is a model that, that we did. It's thicker than the reality because it was quite difficult to to be done in a, in a 3D printer, but somehow uh, represent the texture that the, the monument will have. The second project, uh, the Palacio Pereira, it's, uh, the second is the unintentional monument according to Alois Riegel's categories, imply a negotiation between the value of antiquity and the historical value. In this, case, he was, in this case, he was interested in protecting both the traces of the passage of time, as well as his genesis from another time as a human work. In 2012, we won an international competition called by the Chilean Cultural Office to restore the historical house and design an extension to host the new institution of the ministry. Abandonment is usual uh, in Chilean attitude towards the past and heritage is complex and ambivalent. Regular uh, uh, earthquake take their, their toll. So until the 20th century second half, the city then a rather weak fabric needed to be rebuilt itself every once in a while. This sequence of forced renewal has created a collective move keen to displacement, abandon and decay, an appreciation for the new and ambiguous feeling of loss that is characteristic of local culture, one that involves nostalgia and detachment. In such a context, Palacio Pereira occupied a special place in Santiago's collective me memory. Since the early 80s, it became an abandoned, mysterious remain that embodied the image of a city that was aimed but never complete, really completed. The former palace became a silent testimony of a crumbling social structure and of a, an aborted image of the city. So what began, began as the built expression of a Europeanized elite because of its own abandonment acquired the patina of a reality of its own, that of matter. The material decay provided the building its genuine place within the local context. Paradoxically, sometimes a ring can become more of a process than for of a fixed image. And in this case, after years of abandonment, it ended up becoming a power mobilizer of energy. Thoughts and action in 2011, the Chilean state bought the palace in order to transform it into the Minister of Culture, Art and Heritage headquarters. In 1872, Senator and businessman, Mr. Luis Pereira, commissioned the French architect, Lucien Henault, the design of a urban mansion for this family. At that time, Santiago was in the process of a rapid modernization that need to build the identity of a republic that was at the verge of its founding centenary, promoted a series of major public works in the city. Lucien Ambrose Henault, 
was one of the European professionals brought to the country by the Chilean government to design emblematic works for the new Republic, Republican institution. Educator and then the wing of Jean Nicolas Louis Duran, Henri Labrust, and Eugene Violet Leduc uh, of French structural and planimetic uh, rationalisms, and now arrived in Chile in 1866. Parallel to his public works, Enoch forged links with the local elite and accepted some private commission, such as the residence of Mr. Pereira and his family. Keeping, his, uh, keeping with the continuous facade typical of Santiago Foundational Center, the building sits in the plot of following local traditions. However, typologically, it incorporates new uses and distribute systems. Addressing a more intricate a complex stratification of social relation, whereas at the same time provided a proper theatrical backdrop to the everyday life of the 19th century local elites, during the first half of the following center, the palace ceased to be a domestic residence and then on underwent different uses, which lead to the, a series of alteration of the building. At the end of the 70s, shortly after being declared a national monument, the building entered a phase of decay and abandonment due to the complete lack of maintenance, which produced varying levels of deterioration from partial collapse to a wide range of the structural and superficial damage. A transept constitutes the major feature of the plan, being the element that organize and orientate the most significant spaces in the ground floor. Ending in a courtyard that occupy the back of the property and separate the service areas from those used by the family. This space, this space acts as a sort of interior street, as a place of circulation, encounters, and representation. Eno treated the surface of its walls as public facade, using openings, relief, and ornament to create a sense of rhythm and the feeling of a urban scenario. Restoration must be understood as the implementation of a series of material operation that can bring back certain original splendor. But these actions could also ignore the historical path of the building and the marks of its aging, at the risk to erase traces and potentially knowledge. Thus, to possibilitate and adapt the building to a new life implied a thoughtful articulation between conservation and renovation about antiquity value and that of historical one. The material strategy sought to draw attention to the complexity of inhabitants such a structure, prioritizing neither the new intervention nor the character of the elegant record of the palace. From very early on, we understood this heritage recovery as an operation that has to restore not only the, spice, the spatial and symbolic aspect, but also the technological and fundamentally the original structural performance of the building. This forces this force us to carefully delimit and define alongside engineer and our advisor the operation destined to the structural consolidation. Methodologies processes and materials to be used so that everything would contribute to the building a structural operation as it was conceived. The aim was to have a few intervention as possible. A small number of accurate operation that may ensure the stability of the building facing future earthquakes, the construction of a rigid diagram, diaphragm is in concrete over the existing wooden beam that held all walls and facade together. And the reinforcement of every existing open with a 
10 millimeter thick embed in embedded frame alongside the repair of infinite cracks solve the issue of stability that the historical structure had. In this picture, you can see how this few structural operations interact with the pre-existing and the few picture of the restoration work finally result. Just like the before. The intervention in, in its fragile surfaces with, went very, very slowly. For many months, professional restorers armed with the sculptors were striping the surfaces of both the facade and the interior gallery, trying to reach the original covering with when they still existed. The operation recovered the original chromatic structure of 1873 based on ochre, white, and bluish white pigment incorporated in the mass of the plaster or lime plaster. Strict protocol were defined regarding the reconstruction of ornament establishing that only those that belong to the primary order, such as plinths, pilasters, capitals, and cornices, will be reconstructed when they had been lost and of all the secondary ornament lost, only the essential geometric and volumetric form will be reconstructed. By this way, the intervention of the historic building will avoid highlighting fragmentation and detail. Instead, it aimed to build visual integrity from a certain distance, and at the same time, some kind of translucency between past and present keeping as much as possible of its current sublime atmospheric condition. The value of modernism assigned to the exposed material did not make any sense when this building was constructed. The brick work constitute only the support for the ornamental and symbolic layer that responded to the principle of Beaux-Arts. However, abandonment and ruin violated this principle and left exposed that which should have been covered and thus offer new opportunity to understand the building. The exposed brickwork make present the dimensions and scale of the construction, the material, its structure and the construction technique used in Chile in the 19th century. Likewise, by losing its pavement and therefore erasing the boundaries between one space and the other, it was possible to understand the floor plan as a geometrically rigorous field where the spaces surrounding the glazed gallery coexist without hierarchy. Our proposal thought that this condition could have had a presence in the project and was incorporated as another layer in the history of the building. The pavement were treated as a homogeneous and continuous surface in walnut, erasing any drawing that would emphasize at floor level the condition of self-defined and hierarchical enclosure, prioritizing the new condition of public and democratic space that its future function implied. The masonry was restored and structurally consolidated, and within this two 15 meter high enclosure were introduced two helicoidal staircases, two contemporary sculptural pieces, which fulfill a key function in the new circulation system that the project established to regulate the private and the public areas of the building. In those halls that recover the condition of self-defined enclosure, the ceiling were reconstructed in contemporary code. By thickening the layer of cladding in the upper part of the enclosure, the horizon of the lost original cornice were recovered and the three-dimensionality of the slightly bold ceiling was recovered with painting popular integrity in the main room of the building, which uh, are the offices of the Ministry and the National Monument Council. 
the wood ceiling were silk screened using late 19th century decorative pattern by William Morris, reinterpreting the ornamental intensity of the original lost ceiling. The assignment also included a new building on the ground that successive demolitions and earthquake had feared freed inside the property. The project therefore implied a negotiation between the pre-existent and the new structure between different time, material, and technologies. The original scheme of an interior courtyard in the back was not visible anymore. We wanted the new building to be held responsible for filling the blank resulting from successive demolition and collapses, giving back to the building its space structure in a contemporary way. Following the footprint of the palace original typology, which related the gallery in the form of a cross with the courtyard and its side corridor, the infilling of the new structure gives shape to a new, new courtyard that stand in the same area as the original garden of the uh, Pereira family. At the same time, the new structure embodied the negotiation between all historical time collapsing in one single space. The idea of simultaneity and coexistence of different periods and epoch overlap. We use a noisy and dense isotropic concept for the structure using branch shaped concrete column uh, of 25 by 25 centimeter. In contrast to the continuity and massiveness of the masonry walls, creating a high density inner perimeter around the new courtyard. These columns and their geometry allows us to support the building on the side adjacent to the heritage building, keeping the distance from the interior wall and facade. The fingers of the structure moved according to the specific structural requirement of each area to ensure the structural autonomy of both pieces. Using the image of an scaffolding, the new structure emphasize the temporary and dynamic condition of what we understand for intervention of heritage, alluding to a working process. A structure that allows light and air to get inside and reveal itself through a veil that we hope will help to produce particular vision on history and time and the sight of this temporal layer of coexistence. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you both for those wonderful uh, remarks. Beautiful work. Thanks for sharing. Uh, very inspiring. You're touching upon so many topics, I feel, that are both um, very timeless, but also timely. The question of monuments is a big topic uh, in our own context here, both in Houston and more broadly uh, in the United States. And how do we look at monuments, both as um, artifacts that are sort of physical artifacts, but also um, traces of memory and whose memory is being preserved and how uh, is a big question uh, for all of us. Um, I also really appreciated how you raised very important questions of preservation and conservation in architecture. What does it mean to preserve an artifact or a structure, be it a monument or a building? Um, and the way you work through that process is very engaging because it is very focused on the political aspect of a monument, but also on a very tactile aspect of building construction, um, but also I would say drawing. There is something quite stunning in particular about the way you drew the palace um, and how eventually the building itself looks like a form of a drawing or a form of rendering uh, in, your own, uh, in its own right. Um, it, it's also wonderful that you're bringing very important sort of historical and political references, uh, including the importance of feminist theory and what does that mean uh, for the construction of physical structures. So feminism, not only as a philosophical and theoretical project, or not only a political project, but also uh, an architectural project as well. And in all of that, uh, there is a deep commitment uh, to the beauty and the practice of architecture, to the artifact of a building, 
as a kind of an enduring trace of what we do as architects. And it was visible um, in your lecture um, and also in particular Cecilia behind you in the beautiful models and drawings that you have in your uh, studio. So thank you for that uh, reaffirmation of the role uh, the kind of physical and uh, artifact role that our field uh, plays, which is one of the major foundations of our program too. Will that, with that, I will hand it over to Juan Jose, um, who will bring in some questions and perspectives from the students and the audience as well. Juan Ho. Thank you, Igor, and thank you, Paula and Cecilia, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, uh, I agree with most of the comments that Igor was, was making, and, and actually I have, before handing it to, to our students, I have a question regarding your how you work with the context. I think you have a very particular and very special way to understand the context because you work with you, you develop certain autonomy in the, in the way you develop certain rules in each project and they work autonomously. You have some kind of internal logics and, and you work fearless incorporating and material construction details. This is something that, that is nice to see how you explain the project also showing construction details, explaining about dimensions and adding structural questions like uh, really uh, with, in, in harmony with all these questions and also how you connect this with a specific context. I think I'm very intrigued about how in your process, how you manage to keep this kind of duality between the autonomy of the rules that you develop for the project and the integration of all these technical questions and the specificity of the context in terms of the urban, the, the social and, and the historical context in which you are operating. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Igor, for this amazing resume of, of everything. It was really a perfect synthesis of, of all the topic we want to talk about. And, and concerning the, the question you, you are asking, uh, there is a particular issue in these two, in, in relation with the context, in these two uh, projects we choose today to, to present. Uh, one of them is on a sculpture, so it has some kind of autonomy to the context. Of course, there is there is a park, there is a public space, uh, public use open to the city. Um, and this piece, uh, this element is uh, interacting through its uh, material definition, through its scale, through the, the, um, the programmatic, let's say, in, in terms of some kind of fully integrated in the, in, as a cultural element that belong to the landscape design, the urban landscape design. But the same as the Palacio Pereira is still in the Palacio Pereira also, still it's a singular element that is introduced in a whole in the city and that fulfill the whole thing. So the relation with the with the context in, in the, this second case is a very intimate one. Uh, the new building has no contact with the public area directly, with the city, with the street, with the facade. It's an internal building that is discovered just after being um, passing the, the old building. So somehow it is also uh, like a, a Yonaea piece introduced in this whole, feeling the whole thing. So the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this way, in this, uh, the relation or the conversation between the new piece and the context where that they are uh, put on is more, or is more um, concentrated in the material issue, in the way the material is organized, in the way that material allows a transition between the existence, the park, or the, the monument um, is, is, um, is offering to, to the whole. And, and so the main, the main uh, energy of the project is concentrated in that aspect of the work. And, and that made these two projects very close in terms of conceptual and, and uh, structural 
uh, relation in in, cons in in context relation. Thank you, Cecilia. And I think the two projects are are kind of uh, perfect to to show this kind of tension between the two approaches. Uh, with that, I would like to pass it to our students, Sebastian and Danny, that they, they prepare some questions for you. Um, so thank you so much for your lecture. Um, our first question is your experience in design and academia extends beyond the borders of Chile. So what are some of the elements of your and your generation's approach to design that you feel have been shaped by political, environmental, economic forces? And how do you say that the lessons that you've learned from working in the other and context inform the way that you work abroad? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was not able to understand the question. Maybe someone else who has a better, better uh, internet connection could uh, repeat it. Sebastian, you can, you can go for your question. Let's see if yeah. we can solve her. Issue. Um, okay, uh, so I guess I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I can repeat the same question. Um, so your, your experience in design and academia extend beyond the borders of Chile. Um, what are some of the elements of your and your generation's approach to design that you feel have been strongly shaped by social, political, environmental, and economic forces? How would you say the lessons you've learned from working in a particular Chilean context inform the way you work, work abroad? Well, I, I, I can say that that is not a particular issue about our practice. Uh, architecture is always dealing with all that topic. It's part of our task. Uh, architecture should uh, negotiate and, 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 uh, and make a dialogue, a very fruitful dialogue with the social, economic, and political issue. And especially when we work in the public field of uh, or institutional field, that aspect of the of architecture become a very very important and very present in the in the work. But I think it's not just our um, our um, let's say um, uh, characteristic in, in in the way we face our work. I think is what architecture does everywhere in the world. In your project for Campus Arauco, you collaborated with engineers Joseph Schwartz and Pierluigi Di Punto, as well as wood construction company Bloomer Lehman to introduce new ways of work of building in Chile. What do you think is the role of architects in engaging with experimental technologies that are responding to emerging values in changing contexts? Paula. Your turn. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Now, first uh, uh, of all, uh, we think, and maybe that can uh, respond the, the the question before as well, that uh, we have to, we are part of a multidisciplinary discipline somehow. So, so we all, all always, uh, or most of the time that we can, we we build uh, a, a team. Uh, that can can neuter all all the 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 edges of the project and and we found that very important and and for that we don't we don't just see like uh, uh, the possibilities in Chile so we we see that we can cross uh, uh, go overseas and cross boundary to to build that uh, relation and and tip up with with a with a. a, a, a a team that can, can that can give to us all all the context and 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 and, and broad the the possibility of the project and and that how uh, maybe campus Arauco, that one of the reasons that we came to to do do this project in collaboration with uh, Jof, uh, Joseph and and Pierluigi in 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 that particular. Uh, competition and, and most of the time in competition, uh, there is an opportunity to somehow to move the boundaries uh, a little uh, or, or, or maybe a lot, but uh, we, we, we like to work in competitions because 
is there when you can put your ideas uh, over the on the table and and also like um, experiment uh, in technologies or explore new new possibilities of responding in terms of material in terms of the structure or in terms of uh, how do you relate all the social network that you are facing in that particular project so so yes it is a it is a we think that the architect has a role in moving those boundaries and 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 i think I personally think that competitions are a, a great opportunity to do that, uh, to put the ideas, uh, new ideas, and, and, and to research with a wider team, uh, because otherwise you are always uh, doing what you know how to do. And, and in order to move from, from, from um, a project that is related to the timber construction, to a project that is related to the heritage or to a sculpture, you need to build up that uh, team of collaboration, that network that will allow you to move that boundaries. Thank you, Paula. We have also some questions from the audience. Uh, Xinxiu Chen, she is asking, or he, thank you for the wonderful presentation. You have mentioned international and unique sorry, intentional and unintentional monuments in your talk. Maybe another way to categorize those monuments is that there are monuments that address current occurring and concerns. On the other hand, there are those that address historical events. I want to hear more about your takings on history, architectural and general, and its relation to our contemporary practice, especially given that you have mentioned a, conserv a conservation project. Thank you. Um, well, I I think that the the project of Palacio Pereira, especially, it's it's one of the projects that raises the the boundaries between contemporary and uh, conservation. I mean. I, I am not sure if I will uh, uh, answer the question, but um, I think it's very important uh, for us, and that was the way we assume and we face the work, is to open the, the, the field of architecture to those problems that are very, very specific, uh, um, both in terms of uh, theor theoric, uh, conceptual, and technical uh, aspect. And, and I wanted to connect with what Paula was saying before, and, and it's about the, the, um, the team that put together many different knowledge, many different aspects, and the project become some kind of a discussion of many different ways to go into the complexity of architecture. In that case, the, the, um, the project of Palacio Pereira was uh, led by us as architect, of course, who, who were uh, coordinated the different teams, but were also um, uh, in, uh, included by uh, historic technical uh, specialists on 19th century brick construction, um, uh, specialists also in, in a strategy and international um, uh, concept and, and agreement uh, between uh, countries, between the UNESCO, between ECOMOS, et cetera, that somehow regulate the, the work of, um, of heritage. But even if we follow that path, there is always in the, in the field of uh, conservation, space for contemporary, space for the, the present time for architecture. And that is something that is very important to be, to be aware of it and to somehow um, to, to move that boundary of specialization. Uh, to really create work that can dialogue in an open way to the 
to our time, to the time that we are living with the problems, with the conflicts, with the technologies we are dealing with. So I would say that um, even if there is there are specialities in architecture and, and some of them very, very um, demanding in terms of knowledge, specific knowledge, uh, architects are all of them prepared to focus and to intervene in very complex uh, scenarios. The point is to open the discussion to other other knowledge and to and and to somehow define the project as the result of a, of a conversation um, done by multiple many different voices. Igor, do you think we have time for one more question? Yes, we have time for one more question. Thank you, Juanjo. Sebastian, would you like to make another question for Paula and Cecilia, please? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, it's a bit nuanced and it's, it's maybe related to some of the things that have been already said, but it's more specific to your specific uh, selection of uh, uh, technologies and materials. And so the question is, um, your work often deals with heritage, not only architectural, as with Palacio Pereira, but also natural heritage, as it is the case for uh, Parque Nacional Quebrat. And in all cases, your work demonstrates that technological innovation and experimentation is not incongruous with heritage and preservation. So the question is, is technological innovation something that you see as a particular strategy for heritage projects? And, and as an example, uh, for example, in uh, Parque Nacional Quebrat, you use prefabricated structural modules which could be said to uh, have a less disruptive effect on the land on which it's built. So that's a kind of particular strategy they use for preservation. Yes, I, I will say and, and, and add to what we have been talking that uh, this is a personal point of view, but that the architect is like a game, you know, like uh, you need to understand the rules and you need to understand with who you want to play. So in that case, you can face every project uh, understanding is like each project is 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 a game by by itself so so we address the project by understanding those rules so in in, in it's not just an approach uh, the use of technologies or or, or materiality or or, or maybe the, the, the idea of experimental technology that we can move the boundaries not just with the the, the project associated to heritage, natural or, 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 or like Palacio Pereira, but it's like, it's because in the case of uh, Keulad, uh, there was uh, one main thing that was how far it is from the cities. So, so the approach needed to have a, a project that can uh, reduce uh, the amount of time that the project will be, be built on site. So that uh, lead us to take a lot of decision about uh, a construction system, a, a particular technology. But, uh, but that can be like, a, like that, that approach can be used to every project, not just heritage. It's just to understand which are the rules that, that the project need, uh, or, or need to be faced so to, to, to see how to play and, and which technology to took or which team to build, I think. I would like to add another aspect about what you have called technology and we call with Paula and also in our teaching as material condition of the, the material system which put together structural system, construction system, material organization, etc. For us, that is a very, very, it's a core element of architecture. It's, it's a point of depart and a point of ending in the, in the discussion. And it's also what defines generally the experience of the, the, of, the, of the user of architecture. So when we define the, the technology, we are not just thinking about how to deal with the forces, how to deal with the earthquake, how to deal with the, I don't know, 
all the topics that uh, have to be resolved through architecture. But we are thinking at the same time in simultaneity, how that structure or how that uh, um, solution will affect, will define a certain quality of architecture. And we normally uh, work with some kind of unilayer uh, building. I mean, we don't, uh, we work with exposed structure generally. And so what you perceive, what you feel, what you, uh, uh, with what you interact in the spaces, is the structure itself. It's, it's the way the building is dealing with the forces, is dealing with the energy, is dealing, but at the same time, is defined in that, that is defined in everything that constitutes uh, the living space for us. And that is something very important for us. And you can find it in the different scale of the project from the, the monument for the women, uh, Chilean women in the, in, in the park, in the public space, the Pereira, the Keulat, and many other uh, projects in our practice. Thank you, Cecilia and Paula, for those wonderful thoughts and on that uh, high note and for the love of architecture is this wonderful discipline with a place in the world. We want to thank you once again for being with us uh, here today. We wish you all the best in your collaborative work together and we really look forward to welcoming you to Houston and Texas face to face uh, before too long once the pandemic allows. Juan Jose, uh, Danny, and Sebastian, thank you for helping us host Cecilia and Paola here at Rice Architecture today. Thank you for your questions and thoughtful comments. Uh, in closing, let me also thank all of our audience uh, for attending our event today. We look forward to seeing you again for the fourth installment of our lecture series this fall, which will be next Friday, October 22nd, when we will welcome our very own Liz Galvez and Estefania Barajas, who will present their winning Houston Design Research Grants. This lecture will be presented by our community partnership, outreach, and programming organization, Rice Design Alliance which is soon to be 50 years young. Please join us for this and other events this fall. In the meantime, we wish you good health and all the best from all of us here at Rice Architecture. Thank you again and goodbye.